Yagli do. How's it going? Everything good? Today's lesson is Kenaga Cho Cho Suktu, or language and stories. And the point I want to make today fundamentally is this that Denaina Kenaga, the Denaina language, is <coughs> incredibly beautiful. It is incredibly complex. It is incredibly endangered. And it is incredibly worth it. And what I mean by worth it, among other things, is that it is incredibly worth our time and attention and any investment we make in terms of preserving the language, educating people about the language, teaching the language, speaking the language, um, getting the language into our vocabulary and into our speaking and into our speech practices, that it is worth it, uh, that it is a vital and important part of what we are and who we are here in Tikanu, uh, here in Cook Inlet area. And hopefully at least a few of you after uh, this lecture, if you haven't already, will take the amazing opportunity that's been afforded to us and learn Denaina or one of the other indigenous languages of Cook Inlet, such as Yupik, um, with the many, many classes that are available either through UAA uh, or through KPC, through many amazing professors, um, s such as uh, all the people you see here and many others. So that's a little bit about my spiel. Now, part one, introduction. I want to talk a little bit just about language itself before we kind of dive into Denaina language and Yupik language. So this is a page that you read from Peter Kalfornsky's book, and in it he says, um, it's kind of a declaration of some of the important, so it's a sort of set of statements um, that emerged out of the Native Elders Conference held in Kotzebue in 1982, um, but sort of Peter Kalfornsky wrote these in kind of more of a poetic form, um, these resolutions that the elders had passed, and I want to note several things that these elders said about what was important for education uh, from their vantage point in 1972, where there had been incredible culture change up to that point, uh, you know, well over a century of forced assimilation of various sorts. What did these elders see as important for education? They said to tell about what remains of the past. This is, of course, specifically um, Peter's sort of retelling and poetic way of putting it. So he's going to emphasize Denina things here. That it is their country from the ancient past and that they are Denina. That they should learn to focus their minds. They should learn how to help us. They should be aware. They should know all of the language. They should be aware of the old people and retain all of their language work. They should be aware that this land is Denina land, studied the words, the remaining words, and all the different songs, and the place names that they made long ago. Long ago. <coughs> it is notable to me how frequently language is brought up in this series of statements about what education could be. To some degree, perhaps unsurprising, Peter Kalfornsky was extremely passionate about language. Um, but also interesting, right, of the many things that the elders discussed that day, the ones that stood out to Peter and that Peter wrote here, um, of the many things that one could be educated about, right? There are so many things you can go to school to learn about or that you can go to an elder to learn about. Um, you can learn about finance and business. You can learn about politics. You can learn about uh, engineering. You can learn about chemistry. You can learn about um, linguistics. You can learn about anthropology, you can learn about history, you can learn about so, so, so many things when we speak of education, but it is notable how many times he emphasizes language and words. Why might that be? I want you to think a little bit about that. Why might language be so critical? One of the points I want to make, and it's something I spend a whole semester on when I teach linguistic anthropology, is that language is not just words. And what I mean by that more specifically is language is not just labels. Uh, so we sometimes have a view of the world, or rather of language in the world, as sort of a one-to-one -one sort of thing, where language is simply a way that I take an idea in my head, put a sound to it, and then you can hear that sound, and then in your own brain um, understand the idea that I was trying to get across. We call that like the decoding or coding kind of model of language. Um, and it's one that you see in a lot of sci-fi. I'm a big lover of sci-fi. So for example, here we have Doctor Who. Um, and so 
and Doctor Two and his various companions are able to perfectly speak the languages of the various cu uh, cultures that they come into contact with, typically, or at least mostly speak it, um, because of the magic of the TARDIS. In Star Trek, you have the Universal Translator. Things like this um, suggest this idea of sort of language as a straightforward medium, that different languages are just different ways of labeling reality, but that they're fundamentally are still just ways of labeling reality, right? There's not much difference to them other than you've just got to learn the different sounds. Linguistic anthropology, linguistics in general, Native American studies, many fields are united in saying, no, 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 language is far far more complex than that, far more rich and far more interesting. But of course we don't have to um, take anthropologists' words for it. I would like to share a few statements um, by indigenous elders to this effect. This is Claire Swan, Denaina Elder, who was told on Boris back in 1985, quote, when they took away our language, when they took away our language through things like boarding school, through things like having to learn English to get a job, when they took away our language, they took away our ability to think in our own way. It's interesting to note, too, um, that when you see, uh, when you go to the anthropology lab here at KPC, um, there's a resolution uh, that's hanging on the wall. It was clearly something that Alan Boris was very proud of, um, where he was formally adopted in as a member of the Kanaitsi tribe, and in that resolution, they sort of recognized some of the work that he had done for such with uh, collaborating with uh, various Kanaitsi members, and one of the things that it says was about the importance of language preservation and helping people to like think in our own language, right? So this concept of thinking in our language. Okay, another quote. This one's from Ellen Cushman, a Cherokee scholar, who I particularly like. She says, "Peoplehood and perseverance are sustained through native languages in every body of work." casual conversation or legal document that uses a tribal language. In every body of work, casual conversation or legal document. Every time we use native languages, we are making a space and opening a space for the inclusion of languages that have been marginalized and pushed to the edge and pushed to extinction. Every time we choose to take those languages into our mouths and say those words, we are choosing to make a space for that which has been oppressed and marginalized for many decades. Um, again, both of these quotes, though, testifying to this idea of the idea that Language is more than just labels. It's something central to peoplehood, according to Alan Cushman. Let's talk about that for a minute. This is a concept, there's a concept within American Indian studies, um, as far as I know, first developed by Home Person and Chavez, um, who are both native and non-native scholars who were writing a paper together, and they called it the peoplehood matrix. And one of the things they were kind of grappling with within American Indian studies as a field when it was sort of still in its early days, back in the early 2000s, was what is it that makes a Native American people a people? Which is, you know, actually a really important question when you consider the many different indigenous nations which have been displaced from Native homelands, who have, who may or may not have federal recognition, things who may or may not uh, live in a consolidated community. What does peoplehood mean? They talk about four things that contribute to a sense of peoplehood to an identity of peoplehood, to who you are as a people. They talk about language, they talk about history, and they also sometimes this has been phrased sacred history, they talk about land, a connection to land, and of course that's a connection that can um, keep going even when one is displaced from it, and um, in different complex ways, so, and then also religion, or rather they say sacred ceremonies or ceremonial cycles. I think they kind of play with a few different words to make it clear that it doesn't have to be religion in the organized religion sense. So as we look at that and we think of those different models, they talk about them being functionally interrelated, that all of these things feed into each other, right? For example, as you speak the original language, you're often speaking the place names of the land, right? And also oftentimes telling stories, histories about that land. So all of these are interconnected, um, but they actually make a point of that language may be the most important of all. It's sort of the vehicle through which these other things to some degree happen, right? And indeed, the fact that language is here as a central part of the peoplehood matrix should tell us that, again, language is a lot more than labels. Um, I'm a big fan of what's called, sometimes called the discourse approach to culture, 
um, as anthropologists have sort of mused over how we define culture and what we mean by culture and how culture actually happens, how it is that a group of people come to have roughly similar, if somewhat contested, understandings of the world. How does that happen? Um, one of the, I think, more plausible answers that's been given is a discourse approach. I'm a fan of Greg Urban in this regard, uh, but there's others that we could um, know, like Joel Scherzer, um, Dennis Tedlock, and Bruce Mannheim edited a great book back in the 90s called Dialogic Emergence of Culture that emphasized that it's not just what we say, but what we say in conversation from which cultural meanings emerge. Um, but I really like the way Greg Urban puts it. He points out that culture is not some hive mind that just happens, right? It can only happen as we share a discourse history, as we share similar things that we've heard, similar stories we've heard, similar instances of language that we've heard. He says, furthermore, that if cultural meanings emerge from how we communicate with each other, then it stands to reason that as we analyze communication, we can get at culture. Or as he puts it, culture is localized, i.e. located, in concrete, publicly accessible signs, the most important of which are actually occurring instances of discourse. Or to put it another way, when we look at the words people speak, we are not just looking at another variation of the same words we have, but instead we are getting a glimpse into their culture itself. And so language is a powerful thing in that way. And so I think, I hope all these quotes have given you some sense of why language might be so important, and I hope jogged some of your own ideas. Uh, nobody directly said this, but I would also add, language is fundamentally um, connected to identity. Um, there's some research to suggest among some indigenous communities that communities with higher degrees of language retention, where more people are still speaking their indigenous language, uh, have better mental health outcomes, although that's kind of sporadic, that research, and we could think of case studies that would contradict that. Um, but generally speaking, language is closely tied to identity, um, to people's sense of who we are as a people. And it's a sacred thing um, in that regard, or by which I mean a thing that is very special, uh, very fundamentally special to a group of people. It's also been said um, that language, it can also be said that language connects us to our ancestors, that when we speak the languages of our ancestors, in a sense we are in an embodied way, in a physical way, connecting to them by having our lungs, by having our mouths do the same things that their did, theirs did. Um, in Keith Basso's excellent book that I strongly recommend for anybody, Wisdom Sits in Places, Language and Landscape Among the Western Apache. Keith Basso mispronounces a word in Western Apache that he, when he's interviewing somebody, tries to repeat it a couple times, the guy's missing most of his teeth, so it's hard to hear him. Keith Basso keeps messing it up. Western Apache is a tr tricky language for sure. Um, he keeps messing it up and eventually he says, it's okay, I've got it on the tape recorder. I'll work on it later. It doesn't matter, which is a big mistake. You should never say that. Um, and the person he was interviewing, I think his name was Charlie, said, it does matter. And then he says in Apache, he says, what he's doing is all wrong, he's going too fast. And he says, you know, this is the speech of our ancestors. So when we talk about indigenous languages and when uh, people choose to use indigenous languages of their people, in a sense, they're connecting with their ancestral people, with their ancestors in a very powerful way. So language matters a great deal. It matters is a lot more, again, than just a set of labels. Um, and we'll also talk later in the lecture about some good evidence to suggest uh, that language also shapes our thinking, or at least influences our thinking, or reflects our thinking in powerful ways. That in a very real sense, when we lose languages, when we lose those words, we are, at least in part, losing worlds. And when we learn back languages and breathe new life into languages, we are, in a sense, igniting new worlds or rediscovering old ones. And yet language at the same time is very, very threatened. It's predicted by linguists that up to 50% of indigenous languages could go extinct by 2100. There are a variety of different reasons for that, um, both push and pull factors. A push factor meaning something that compels someone not to speak their native tongue, a pole factor meaning something that entices somebody to speak a foreign language other than their native tongue. Uh, and so pole language might be, um, let's say you're an English speaker and you watch a lot of anime, uh, perhaps learning Japanese, that would be a pole factor, the entertainment, right? And it doesn't necessarily take you away from your native language, 
but it, um, but let's say um, in a more extreme example, if the only language you could get a job in, uh, let's say you worked in Japan and it was a lot easier to get a job in Japanese than if you only spoke English, that would be a very powerful pull factor. And you might find yourself speaking a lot more Japanese during your workday than English, right? It'd be a pull factor that direction. A push factor would be when you're typically kind of like forced away from your language for one reason or another, or kind of pushed in another way. When we look at the history of Dena'ina people in Cook Inlet, we see a lot of push and pull factors. Um, and what we also see is that in a sense, Russian and later English came to sort of colonize the major spaces of discourse and what I, the major theaters of discourse. And what I mean by that is, if you think about how language works, language is something that we're exposed to and use in multiple different kinds of spaces, right? And that we have reinforced in multiple kinds of spaces. Um, it's one thing to, back to my example of move, if you move to Japan, it's one thing to use Japanese, um, here in the States, maybe only in the entertainment sphere of your life. Um, but if you are in Japan and using it in your work life, in your daily life, speaking to your neighbors, right? That's a much more total immersion. Um, there are different domains of language and the more domains sort of get taken by one language, the more powerful that language's sway is going to be. Russian and later English became dominant in many different domains of Denina life throughout the late 1700s, particularly the 1800s and then the early 1900s. I'll mention several ways. First was it became the language of business. Um, in the early 1800s, late 1700s and the early 1800s, as we'll talk about more in later lectures, Denina people became increasingly drawn into um, the economy, the Russian economy and later the American economy. Uh, first through the fur trade rush under the Russians, later through the cannery um, businesses of the Americans, and eventually other kinds of business enterprises from the United, from Anglo-Americans as well. And as this was happening then, um, Russian during the fur trading period and then English during the cannery period became sort of a lingua franca for business. It was, as Alan Boris puts it, uh, it was typically Denina people picking up Russian or English, not <laughs> um, Russian speakers or English speakers picking up Denina. There were exceptions, certainly. Um, my understanding is that some Russian Orthodox priests chose to learn some Denina, which, um, but many cases it was a one-way language transmission. And so if that's the, so the, the world of business, the world of enterprise, if you wanted to participate in a cash economy, which eventually became sort of the only option as more and more land was taken, as people had become more and more used to a, a life way that involved um, the types of material items that are related to a cash economy. As all of these things started to change, English became sort of this dominant business language, the lingua franca that you had to speak to be successful economically in most areas. You had areas far, far inland, such as Lime Village, where that was less the case, and that's also where we still have um, a, lar a larger number of native Denina speakers, or I should say first language Denina speakers. Nonetheless, for most Denina people uh, during the 1800s and 1900s, English became the language that you had to know to be economically successful. Um, it uh, Over time, Russian, and then later English, also became the language of religion, of ceremony. So very after the um, devastating flu epidemics of 1918 and 1919, as we'll talk about more next week, or no, sorry, two weeks from now. Um, many, many, many Denina people converted to Russian Orthodoxy. It had already been starting before that, but it accelerated to the degree to where nearly a, a very, very high percentage, the vast majority of Denina people converted to Christianity, which during the Russian period meant Russian Orthodoxy, which meant that they were um, learning or speaking Slavonic languages in church, right? When people went to worship ceremonies, um, they were speaking in those languages, right? So it was Russian or High Slavonic that was being used in religious contexts. You then have the language of, so it becomes the language of ceremony. And then of course later during the American period as English speaking missionaries move into the area, um, it typically becomes the language in which, let's say if you're a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Methodist as a Denina person, that's typically most often the language that's being spoken in your religious services. So it became the dominant language of religion. Um, and of course, the dominant language of entertainment, we can see that in many different ways. Um, but perhaps, you know, with the spread of TV, the spread of radios, English would be have been being spoken more and more and more in Denina homes. But perhaps the most, most impactful thing, I think most people would agree, 
um, was that English became not just the dominant language, but indeed the forced and coerced language of education. Um, starting in the late 1800s, in 1878, there started to be American boarding schools in Alaska. If you're not familiar with American boarding schools, sometimes these were run by the U.S. government or the state governments, and sometimes these were run by Christian missions of various sorts. Um, and many of the founders or administrators of these schools saw it as their mission um, to get Native Americans, or in this case specifically Alaska Native people, um, to assimilate them into sort of quote-unquote American uh, sort of Euro-American typically is how that's being read, um, culture to get people, the idea was sort of native languages dying or unproductive and it's going away and people need to learn the dominant culture and that's how they will be successful. That's the um, very blunt and horrific statement that was made uh, in regard to the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania. They said, um, kill the Indian, save the man. So that was the philosophy at the time, a horrific policy in my opinion. And it was very much forced assimilation, not voluntary assimilation. And so in the boarding schools, um, which eventually sort of became mandatory in the sense that people had to send their children to school, right? In the boarding, because it was part of their, you know, legal responsibilities at first, um, or it was part of their legal responsibilities. Anyways, in the boarding school context, um, people were forced to speak English. Denina children and other Alaska Native children were forced to speak English. Um, there are traumatic stories that you hear and read. Um, young girls being forced to pray on rock salt um, with their bare knees because they're wearing a dress, right? Um, Denina kids in general or other Alaska Native kids having mouths washed out with soap. These are traumatic terrible things and people were forced to speak English and um, had the continual message that their language was less than, that it was inferior. Whew. This had tremendous and long-lasting impacts, um, as it did indeed for many, many regions of the country. The boarding school period was a tremendous period of language loss across Native North America, Native North America, um, one which the federal government of Canada has formally apologized for, I don't think the US government has ever apologized for, but correct me if I'm wrong. Whether they've apologized for it or not though, the legacies are tremendously long lasting. Part of what happens here is that you had a generation of students who for much of the year, so I should explain, these were residential boarding schools, so oftentimes kids, students were away from their parents for let's say nine months out of the year. So students were away from their home only speaking English when they were at the age where they should have been getting more and more proficient in their native language. And even kids that were proficient in their native language, you know, getting it during summers and also in their first several years before they went to school, they then come back with the, um, this sort of bad association with the language, uh, this sort of internalized sense of shame about it for some people. Some people report this and then sometimes did not teach it to their children as a result or felt that it wouldn't help their children be successful in the face of this like onslaught of cultural change that they needed to teach them English. And so we had one, two, three generations where the language was just not being taught very much in many communities in Cook Inlet, and therefore profound language loss. Um, so as a result of both pull factors of sort of getting jobs in English, but then also the very coercive push factors of things like the boarding school system, Denina under went serious, serious decline uh, to the point where now it is spoken by certainly fewer than a hundred people, if we mean fluent speakers who sort of grew up speaking it. Uh, the number of people who speak it at least partially is much more difficult to estimate, um, and that's kind of a slightly happy story because people are starting to pick it up again and revitalize it and we have classes at places like the Denina Language Institute at Canaitse Indian Tribe or at UAA language is being revitalized. People are picking it up. So people have varying degrees of fluency. So it would be hard to say how many people we have now who are at least partially fluent speakers. That would be really difficult to say. Um, but as far as elders who sort of grew up speaking it, the number is under 100. In fact, it's under 50. So that is a, a very endangered place to be. The language is highly, highly endangered. Um, and thus the importance, I think, I believe, of investing heavily in its revitalization.